Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to our ongoing series of lectures on anesthesiology. Today, we're going to talk about uh, regional anesthesia and analgesia, both how we can provide anesthesia uh, for surgical uh, procedures and how we can produce analgesia for postoperative pain management. So the agenda for this lecture will be some definitions, a description of two major neuraxial blocks, uh, epidural and spinal, a description of several uh, limb blocks, including brachial plexus block for the upper limb, and some lower limb blocks, including uh, femoral nerve block and uh, ankle block. A very uh, brief discussion of autonomic nervous system blocks for pain and diagnostic purposes, and then a somewhat more expanded discussion of intravenous regional anesthesia. So the definitions are pretty straightforward, actually. The injection of local anesthetics into areas to produce anesthesia sufficient for surgical procedures to per be performed without discomfort to the patient. That's regional anesthesia. And that's typical of uh, subarachnoid block or spinal block. It's also typical of what we see with epidural blocks. With peripheral nerve blocks, it's never quite as clear as that. Uh, we certainly can, produce, can do surgery with some of these blocks, but in many cases, the blocks are inadequate for surgical anesthesia, but produce excellent postoperative analgesia. So regional analgesia is the injection of the same local anesthetic into areas of the body to produce analgesia for postoperative pain relief. These blocks are commonly used in upper limb surgery to produce postoperative analgesia. Some of these blocks are sufficient to provide anesthesia for surgery, but the duration of surgery and the position of the patient during surgery results in them being used primarily for analgesia. So epidural anesthesia, uh, and this is a slide to give you some idea of the anatomy of the spinal cord. And you will see as uh, you look at the slide, on the lower portion of the slide is the dorsal spinous uh, process of the vertebra. And just interior, interior to that, going uh, uh, towards the large white object at the back, which is the body of the vertebra, you pass through a number of ligaments and the spinal column itself. Before you get to the spinal column, there's a thick ligament called the ligamentum flavum. And it is the space between the ligamentum flavum and the coverings of the spinal cord that is the epidural space. That's where we put epidural catheters, that's where we inject for epidural analgesia or anesthesia. If we just pass the needle a tiny bit further, two or three millimeters at most, we actually enter the spinal cord space, and uh, that's what we do when we're doing spinal anesthetics. So the catheter is inserted between the ligament of flavum uh, and the dura of the spinal cord, uh, which is really kind of a potential space. It's filled with fat and blood vessels. We can actually uh, transport a, a catheter into that space, uh, and we inject local uh, anesthetics, usually quite dilute, into the space, and that can produce good analgesia to the lower half of the body. The concentration of the local anesthetic determines the depth of the block, in other words, the intensity of the block and it can be adjusted to allow the patient to walk with the epidural in place, or if we need to take the patient to the operating room and operate, uh, we can actually deepen the intensity of the block, increase the intensity of the block to do surgery. And this commonly happens uh, in women who are in labor. We use very dilute solutions to uh, prevent pain during labor. And then if we do need to take them to the operating room and do a cesarean section, we increase the intensity of the block so they'll tolerate the actual surgical procedure. So the easiest way to put it in epidural is with the patient in the sitting position because this straightens the spine. And I'm going to refer to the patient as a woman because in most cases, more commonly we use it in women than in men simply because uh, it's widely used in obstetrical anesthesia. We draw a line between the superior uh, spines of the uh, uh, of the pelvis, and in theory that line goes through the dorsal spine, the dorsal uh, uh, spinous process of the uh, of the uh, lumbar four vertebra. Uh, 
In fact, recent studies have shown that it varies anywhere up to one to two vertebra uh, from that position. But we usually still do this technique just to get a, a sense of where we're going and to feel the landmarks in the, in the back. And the landmarks we're feeling for are the dorsal spines of the lumbar vertebra and the spaces between the lumbar vertebra. You don't have to have the patient sitting to put in an epidural, and frequently women in labor find it more comfortable to be on their side when the epidural is placed. So one has to learn how to uh, place the epidural uh, with the patient in the lateral position, either left or right lateral, which means you have to learn how to kind of go backwards in some situations, particularly if they're lying in the right lateral position facing away from you. But uh, amazingly, it, it's, quite, uh, it's quite possible to learn how to do this. It's unusual to put the patient's head up or down, but sometimes patients will request this, and it certainly is possible to put in an epidural with the patient in those positions. So this is the needle insertion for the lumbar space, and this is the kind of epidural we place for labor and for lower abdominal or limb surgery. If you look very carefully at the diagram of the vertebra, you'll see that the dorsal spine, that portion of the vertebra that sticks out towards the back, is very short and straight in the lumbar region. So the needle is usually placed just under the dorsal spine, above the subsequent dorsal spine in the space and slid in uh, through the ligaments towards the epidural space. The thoracic insertion is quite different and we use thoracic epidurals for uh, management of pain postoperatively after thoracic uh, surgery and after upper abdominal surgery. You can see that the thoracic vertebra, the dorsal spine, doesn't come straight out. It actually uh, points inferiorly. It points towards the bottom. And to come in on the midline in this situation is quite difficult. You have to come in at an angle that's very steep and it feels very unnatural when you're doing that. So most of us actually step away from the vertebra uh, to approximately one and a half to two centimeters uh, lateral to the vertebra and come in on an angle from the side, but not near as steep an angle, much, uh, much shallower angle, and it's much easier to do that way. How do we find the epidural space? I pointed out to you uh, previously that the epidural space is really almost an imaginary space. It exists, but it's, uh, it's not like a hole or an open area in the body. It's, it's an area that's packed full of blood vessels and fat. But the interesting thing is that its major connection with the rest of the body is through the, through the thorax, through the chest. And because of that, it changes pressure uh, in the same way as the pressure in the chest changes. And the pressure in the epidural space is lower than the pressure in surrounding tissues. So we can insert a needle. Uh, usually when we put it in, we can feel the ligament of labum. It's usually a fairly tough ligament, except in pregnant women where it can be quite soft, but it's usually tougher than the surrounding tissues. And you can almost feel the tip of the needle popping through it. And while we're advancing it, we're putting pressure on the syringe, which is full of saline. And as you pop through the ligament of flavum, you get what's called a loss of resistance. The syringe just empties. And it's very sudden and very dramatic. People use different solutions in the syringe. They use saline or air or a mixture of the two. I used to use air, then I went to a mixture of the two. I now always use saline. I get a very distinct feeling as you go through the ligamentum flavum and you lose the, uh, uh, the resistance that you're feeling as you advance the needle. You then disconnect the uh, syringe from the needle uh, hub and you pass a catheter through the syringe, uh, through the, excuse me, through the needle, uh, which then passes up into the epidural space. This is a typical uh, epidural needle. This is called a TUI needle, uh, and you can see it in the, in the middle diagram here. The, T, the TUI tip uh, is quite large. Uh, it's at a bit of an angle, and if you look very carefully, you can see that it's got a cutting edge. It's quite a sharp uh, needle. It'll actually cut through that ligamentum flavum. On the right part of the diagram, you can see the catheter beside the needle, once the needle's in place and you've done your loss of resistance, you take a stylet out of the needle and then you pass the catheter through. So what's the difference between an epidural and a spinal? Well, the big difference is three millimeters and it's, it's a very small distance when you're putting pressure on the back 
uh, and you can feel the needle moving forward. But epidurals produce good anesthesia, but not profound anesthesia. So patients with an epidural block will feel pressure when the, when the surgeon pushes on their abdomen, um, may in, uh, feel position changes as the surgeon moves back and forth, uh, and may have some sense of, of work going on. Sometimes patients will actually describe that they can feel the, the surgeon's hand, but they don't have pain. It's a very good technique for patients in labor because you can use it for an extended period of time because a catheter is placed and you can give very dilute local anesthetics over a period of time that cause excellent labor pain relief. And then if you have to, you can change it to an anesthetic for surgical uh, pain. You could adjust the rate of flow through the catheter. You can adjust the dose and strength of the uh, local anesthetic that's being used to um, modify your block to the patient's needs. But it's, it's uh, the big difference between epidural and subarachnoid block, as I said, is three millimeters. But the difference in block is quite profound. The first thing is that when you get into the spinal space, the subarachnoid space, you're actually in the central nervous system. And you'll see in a picture I'm going to show you in a moment that you get cerebral spinal fluid dripping out of the needle. You do not place a catheter in this situation. You merely inject local anesthetic, sometimes with very dilute uh, morphine or other uh, uh, narcotic uh, into the space. You get a very profound block. The patients have absolutely no sensation uh, below the waist with this block. So those sensations of pressure or movement that I described for the epidural are absent in the case of a spinal. And for the ideal surgical situation, a spinal is actually superior to an epidural. The negative about a spinal is you can't adjust it. You can't uh, decrease or change the flow of the drug. It's a one-shot technique. So this is what happens with a spinal. The needles we use for spinals now are very small needles. And I'll show a picture in a moment of what the tip of the needle looks like because there's been a dramatic change in the shape of these needles over the years. But the needles are small. They're very, uh, they're very fine needles. Uh, they actually have to be put through an introducer. So the first thing we do is we put some local anesthetic in the patient's skin. We place an introducer in the position that we want to pass the spinal needle. And then we pass the spinal needle through the introducer. And as you become more experienced, you can feel the needle popping through various levels of ligaments. You hit the, the, uh, uh, the ligament of flavum and you get quite a big pop and then you advance just a tiny bit more, that two or three millimeters that I mentioned before, and you can feel another pop. Uh, and th at that point, if you take the stylet out of the needle, you get cerebral spinal fluid coming out, as you can see in this, uh, in this picture. As soon as that happens, you disconnect the syringe, you, you take a syringe that's already been preloaded with the local anesthetic, you attach it to the spinal needle and you inject it. And within seconds, the patient will note that the bottom and the legs are warming up. And within a very few minutes, the legs and the middle part of the body just simply disappears. So these are two types of spinal needles. The one in the middle is called a quinky needle. And this is an old fashioned needle, although we still use it in some situations. They tended to be larger needles, but you can see that the tip of the needle is sharp and you may not be able to tell from the picture, but that whole area around the hole in the needle tip is a cutting edge and it'll cut through tissues very easily. The problem with this needle is that it caused holes that were big enough for cerebral spinal to con uh, fluid to continue to leak out of the central nervous system after the block was in place. And this could lead to extremely severe headaches, which were sometimes quite difficult to treat. About 20 years ago, a new type of needle was introduced, and this was the Sprott needle. And that's the one on the right of this diagram. And you can see that the tip is different. It's a pencil point tip. It has no cutting edge. It basically forces its way between the fibers of the ligaments without cutting them. 
the hole in this needle is not right at the tip. It's down a little bit down the shaft. And in the sprot needle, it was a very big hole. And that became a problem because it was possible to have a portion of the hole in the sub subarachnoid space and a portion of it outside the subarachnoid space so that when you injected the local anesthetic, some of it would go into the right place, but some of it would just get lost. The needles we use now are the ones that I use now are called Whitaker needles and they're very similar to the Sprott except the hole is much smaller and much closer to the tip and the chances of uh, injecting local anesthetic into the wrong space is largely eliminated. The incidence of headaches uh, with these needles is well under 1%. Whereas with the quinky needle in pregnant women, it was around 60%. So it's a huge change. And it's allowed us to use spinal analgesia in, in uh, obstetrics, whereas before we had to use epidurals.